Welcome to the Gospel Truth Show produced by Cross and Crown Radio. We want to make a lasting difference in your life and in our community. Our mission is to produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for God's people and folks all around the world. Post a comment or a question and sit back and enjoy the show. GospelTruthShow.Podbeam.com Frederick Nietzsche was a powerful atheist. He's a guy that coined the term, God is dead. He's a guy that wrote the book, The Antichrist. This guy was a robust, powerful atheist who brought forth arguments. His arguments ultimately fail and they're bad ideas, but at least he tried, unlike some of the modern new, new atheists who say, well, you know what, I want to have a weak form of atheism, a silly form of atheism, just say atheism is just a lack of belief in any god or gods. Okay, have that. That's easy to refute. Nietzsche, though, he brought forth a powerful, stern approach to his atheism and argued for it. Nietzsche said this, What is evil? Whatever springs from weakness. Then he says, What is good? Whatever augments the feeling of power, the will to power, power itself in man. That's what Nietzsche said. And he said that the weakness and the blight of Christianity is helping the poor and the weak and the needy. He said that was wrong. And of course, he needed help late in his life when he thought that he was Jesus Christ because he was ill with syphilis. He declared himself Jesus Christ the last few years of his life. So much for his atheism. So Nietzsche was an antichrist. He was an atheist. No longer is an atheist because now he's dead and so he knows for sure that God exists. So within this video and within our ministry, we try to provide and demonstrate the certainty of God's existence. Spiritual certainty, mental certainty, as well as psychological certitude, rational assurance, and logical certitude. That's what we try to do. That's what we aim to do. And we have hundreds and hundreds of videos on that, including this program today. See, nobody on their right mind has enough blind faith to believe, to honestly believe, that order came from disorder, that uniformity came from the accidental, that intelligence came from non-intelligence. I mean, nobody has enough blind faith to believe that. That design came from chaos, that personality came from non-personality, that love came from just hard matter, that something came from nothing, or as some of the newer New Atheists say, everything came from nothing. Nobody has enough blind faith to really hold that. It's silly, it's a bad idea to even try to hold that idea that everything came from nothing. And of course the DNA code. How can a code come without a code giver? It seems impossible. So Romans 1 tells us that atheists know that God exists, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They see all this evidence, they see all the proof, but they deny, they deny, they deny, and they suppress and suppress and suppress. How is it? It's like this guy. Say there's a black guy who's a racist, but he says, oh, no, I'm not a racist. Just like the atheist says, no, there's no proof for God. You know, there's none of that. I, I really don't believe in God. I really don't believe in God. Picture a racist who says, I'm not really a racist. I'm not really a racist. And he's black. And he walks down the street. And every time he walks down the street and there's a white person on his side of the street, he crosses over every time. Every time he sees a white person on his TV, he has to change the channel. Every time. Every time he, but he says, I'm not a racist. And every time he sits on the public bus and a white person sits next to him, he's got to move. But he declares, I'm not a racist. He may say that, but his actions betray his actual belief. And atheists know that God exists. Why? Look how moral they are. Many atheists are super in their morality. They're wonderful moral people. Why? Because they know that God exists. Even though they suppress it, they know that God exists, including his moral law. And so they try to be good people. They try to do these things in their life because they know that God exists. Now, even when they try to declare and assert and prove and demonstrate that God doesn't exist, they have to utilize God's logic. So just like that guy that was a racist who said no, his actions betray what he really believes. When the atheist uses God's logic, when the atheist uses God's morality, they're declaring that they know that God exists. So there's numerous arguments for the existence of God. I'll just cover a few really quickly here. Then we'll try to give an exposition on two or three of them and see if you can understand them. We see the argument for mathematics. Powerful argument. You can see that in my book called Fake Atheism on Amazon. I discuss numerous, countless arguments in that book, Fake Atheism on Amazon. Also, uh, Raider's modal tag, very powerful argument. Also, the argument from propositions, the argument from truth, that one I'm going to try to cover today, the argument from truth. Also, 
the transcendental argument for logic, the evidential argument for the resurrection of Christ, the evidential argument from messianic prophecies, the evidential argument for the uniqueness of Christ, that nobody's like Jesus. Nobody loved like him. Nobody ever died on the cross like he did for us. Nobody ever spoke like him. Nobody ever died and rose again on the third day like he did. This is Jesus. The transcendental argument from causality. The argument from concepts. Taylor's ontological argument. And on and on and on it goes, including the argument for moral absolutes, which we're going to cover later. So, one of the main points is to understand that God must exist. That life does change. We can see that in our own lives. That if you're 10 years old, look at yourself when you were 6, you can see you're changed. If you're 25, look at yourself at 15, you've changed. We know that everything in the world changes. Think of all the new technology. Think about all the things in your life. We no longer hardly ever use DVDs anymore. We don't use many uh, certain aspects of life just in the 1990s because things change. In 1920, think of the life in those days compared to what we have now with our smartphones and our computers and the entertainment that we have and what we see. Change occurs over and over again. A researcher found there are 43 things that if they change and pile up in your life, they can be tremendous stress and even a sense of being overwhelmed in your life. And that's one reason so many people fall into problems with anxiety because so much change. So my brain chemistry changes every moment. My physiology changes every moment. The world around me changes at every moment. Everything in the physical cosmos is in flux. It's always changing. It's not immutable, but it is mutable. So keep that in mind. Here is a version of the argument from truth. Immutable, universal, absolute, transcendent truth exists. Like 2 plus 2 is 4. It's 4 here, it's 4 there, it's 4 on Mars, it's 4 everywhere. Across the universe, 2 plus 2 equals 4. So it's immutable, it's universal, it's absolute, and it's transcendent. Immutable, universal, absolute, transcendent truth is ontologically greater and loftier than the material cosmos and the human mind since both are not absolutely universal, immutable, and transcendent. God, who is immutable, has universal power and reach, is absolute in his aseity, and is transcendent. He has the ontological capacity to account for immutable, universal, absolute, transcendent truth. If Immutable, universal, absolute, transcendent truth, then God. Immutable, universal, absolute, transcendent truth, thus God. God must exist. To attack that argument must also presuppose the truth within that argument. So it is a certain ironclad argument, and it demonstrates that God must exist. So this truth grows even as you attack it. It's kind of like if you want to attack it, it's like taking a thimble of water and throwing it into the ocean when you're attempting to empty the ocean or drain it. You're only adding more water to the ocean, and when you attack this argument, you're only adding more force to it. There's another argument that's similar, that's a sister argument, and it's this. It's the argument from analysis and demonstrating as well as reasoning about certain facts. The examination of truth. The examination of things in our world. See, examination and analysis of any evidence presuppose universal immutables. The universal immutables presuppose God. The examination and analysis of evidence presuppose and require God. So even as you're using your analytical skills and examining the truth within this video, even if you're an atheist and trying to find a way to disprove it, you're actually proving it, like that thimble of water being thrown back into the ocean. There's another argument from the Messianic prophecies of Christ. See, one-fourth of the Bible is prophetic. Many things, including cities and towns and wars and other factors in history, were predicted and they came true. A guy named Cyrus was predicted to be a king 142 years before it happened, and it happened just on time. You can see that in Ezra chapter 1. We see over 300 predictions about Jesus Christ coming true. All of them came true in the life of Christ, including his crucifixion. That is just one of the predictions about Jesus Christ that came true, the crucifixion. Now keep that in mind. The crucifixion 
was not even invented until 500 years after the prediction was made. 1000 BC, the prediction is made. About 500 some years later, crucifixion was invented. Some say by the Persians. And then later, Jesus was crucified. So the prediction came even before that form of execution was invented. So it also predicts in the Bible that Jesus would be a descendant of Isaac. It predicted that he would be a descendant of Jacob. It predicted that he would be a descendant of David's throne. It predicted that he would be rejected by his own people. It predicted that he would preach in parables. It predicted that he would be betrayed. It predicted the price of money that would be paid for his arrest. It predicted that he would be crucified with criminals. It predicted that they would gamble for his clothes. It predicted what they, he would be given on the cross. And on and on and on and on. Over 300 predictions about one guy all came true in the life of Christ. And you say, well, that could be easy. Anybody could do that. Well, here's the deal. Nobody else ever has. So keep that in mind. 300 predictions about one guy, Jesus, written before he came. The Dead Sea Scrolls are dated before he came, have the same predictions. They were all fulfilled by Christ. We have extra biblical literature that also demonstrate that these saints occurred in Christ's life, including hostile sources. So we have all these predictions. They all came true in one guy. Nobody else in all history who started a religion or any other movement ever had this predictive material, 300 predictions about their life all coming true in Jesus Christ. The odds of that happening are more than one to the amount of electrons there are in the universe. In other words, mathematically impossible. Not one to the amount of stars within the cosmos. That would be great. That would be fabulous. That would be stupendous. But it's more than that. The amount of electrons in the universe for those to happen just by chance. So we know this can't happen. It had to be done by God and his providence. And so if you talk to a, a, a new atheist and you're having a conversation and some of them can get really, really nasty, they can act really childish, they can be very strident and they bring forth dreadful comments onto your comment page. Big deal. It's just a name, maybe a little ghastly, but what they're doing is they're showing their own heart. They're demonstrating what's inside their heart. So don't worry about that, but discuss things with them. Talk to them. Yes, sometimes you must be firm with them. You must call them to repent. But also ask them questions like, okay, prove to me that you exist. Good luck with that from an atheist worldview. The worldview that says, well, we don't know if there's a God or not. We just have a belief of a lack of a belief in God. <laughs> Think about that one, right? So ask them, prove to me you exist. Ask the atheist, can you be wrong about everything that you think you know? Ask them that question. See what their answer is. Ask them if they're certain that there are other minds. Within the atheist worldview, even if atheism that they define is some of what some of the newer new atheists define, atheism is just a lack of belief in gods or God, even that one, good luck trying to give an answer to those questions. They won't be able to do it. Now remember the bombast, bombastic Madeleine Murray O'Hare. She was one who helped create the strong atheistic movement in the United States. This guy was a staunch atheist who made tons of money for atheism, right? But what happens though, she made so much money as an atheist, you know, <laughs> duping all the other little tiny atheists in the world. She made so much money on that, that she ended up getting kidnapped as well as her grandchildren. Now, her child who was a Christian did not get kidnapped, but she did and her two atheist children or grandchildren. So they get kidnapped by two atheists. <laughs> so there's five atheists. Can you imagine that room? How did the, the three atheists who got tied up and gagged, if they were being allowed to be ungagged and talk to the other two atheists, how would that conversation go? What would Madame Murray O'Hare say to the atheists that you're doing something wrong? By what worldview? By what standard? By what unchanging standard? By what moral absolute? They're just seeing evolution take place, that the might is growing like Nietzsche. You know, might makes right. They have the power to do this, to tie you up and to take your money, which is what these atheists did to these other atheists, torture her and her grandchildren, and then take all their money. They cut off fingers and thumbs, and they really, really abuse these people, which is horrible, horrible stuff. But yet, unfortunately, she did reap what she sowed. And that's what happened to the bombastic atheist, Madame Murray O'Hare, at the hands of other atheists. We know, as we said earlier, 
that many, many atheists are moral and ethical people. Some live really ethical lives. We know that. We are glad of that. We embrace that. But the question is, can they account for that? All they can say is, I want to do this because it works better for me or for society. But they cannot give you an absolute foundation for moral truths that are unchanging. Can't do it. So it's true that God exists. We know that he must exist. We know that people cannot believe, believe these blind uh, things that atheists try to believe. It's crazy, it's silly, it's dreadful. Yes, we know all that, and yet we must reach out to them. And if you're an atheist, agnostic, or a person of a, another religion, you say, man, I don't know what to do now. The last recording Elvis Presley ever made was He'll Have to Go. That was in October of 1976. The last song that Elvis performed in private was a rendition of Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain in August of 1977. Yet his last song in public was, Are You Lonesome Tonight? His last song was Eerie. It was his 1960 hit that went gold, Are You Lonesome Tonight? But seconds before he sang the song, he said to his audience, Are You Lonesome Tonight? You see, fame and fortune and success will not meet your most essential needs. Your ministry as an atheist or your anti-ministry, if you will, your aggression against God, it will not meet your inner needs. And when you close your eyes the last time on earth and open them in God's judgment chamber, it won't go good for you. So you need Jesus. The old movie, The Ten Commandments, has Yul Brynner. This is a kind of a classic, but I think it's a little cheesy, but, you know, I, I pushed through the movie. There's Charlton Heston as Moses. One of the most interesting things about the story of the Ten Commandments is a plague of frogs. You know, most people don't like frogs, but there they are. Frogs everywhere. Frogs in the bed, their dishes, their baby crib, the toilet. The Bible says the frogs were all over the place. It was just ugly. I'm sure Mrs. Farrell said to Mr. Farrell, you know, you got to do something about these frogs. So one day Moses comes to Yul Brenner, Pharaoh, and he says to Pharaoh, what do you think? And Pharaoh says, all right, Moses, I give up. And Moses asked, what do you want me to do? Get rid of the frogs. When do you want me to do it? And the classic answer, the classic answer that Pharaoh said was, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Must have been crazy. One more night with the frogs. There's a famous sermon called, One More Night with the Frogs. He procrastinated. He put off something that important. And you know, we often do that. We procrastinate. We put off changes that would help us and bring blessings in our lives. And we live one more night with the frogs. If you're an atheist, agnostic, or you called yourself some other religion, forget about all that right now. It's your opportunity to come to Jesus. Just put off all that stuff and just tell the Father that I believe. I believe in Jesus, that he died on the cross for all my sins. I believe he was buried and he rose again on the third day. I believe this. I give him my heart and my life. I turn from my ways. I'll follow Christ all the days of my life. If that's you, get a Bible app on your phone or on your computer. Write us or bring a comment or message us on Facebook or give us an email and we'll send you a hard copy of the Bible if you want one. But get a Bible app even right after this show's over. Also join a really good Bible-believing church as soon as you can. And so this is Pastor Mike Robinson until next time saying, May God richly bless you. Hey guys, you can really help us if you donate to our worldwide media outreach. Just go to our Patreon page at Mike Robinson Apologetics on Patreon or click the donate button on our main page on YouTube and give as the Lord leads. Thank you so much.